What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of the Stack Strength Podcast. I'm your host, as always, Daniel DeBrock, and today I'm sitting with Ben Yane. So first off, uh, Ben, thanks so much for jumping on, man. It's it's great to have you here. Daniel, thanks for having me, brother. I'm excited to uh, to chat today. I know we got some good topics in store, and uh, yeah, I've listened to your podcast a good amount of times actually prior to this, so happy to be honored to be on and to be uh, talking to you today. Oh, sweet, man. Thanks. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, so can you give a little bit of a background of yourself for maybe those who aren't familiar with you and some of your work and what you're doing? Sure. Yeah. So um, I was the classic failed athlete story. Uh, I played sports my whole life, mainly football, baseball, and lacrosse. Um, and when I went to college, originally I was planning on playing lacrosse. Long story short, didn't work out. Um, but I was okay with that. Uh, and to kind of fill that competitive need, I just felt like, uh, you know, getting really deep into the lifting thing. And, and that's kind of where it all started for me. Obviously I was lifting, you know, for football and, and lacrosse and stuff prior to then. So it was always kind of like an adjunct, just like it is for many, you know, athletes, um, you know, to the, to the sport. Um, but you know, I, I've never competed in powerlifting or bodybuilding, but, um, I'm just one of those, you know, kind of typical gym bros who likes to lift, likes to power lift, or at least I used to. Um, and eventually I worked my way into personal training because of that. Um, you know, I wanted to, to work with athletes initially, but I found that at least at the school, uh, in undergrad that I was working at, uh, the athletes didn't really, a lot of them, you know, baseball guys, I worked with a lot, even football guys, they didn't really care too much about the lifting portion of things, especially at like six or 7 AM. So, you know, I worked in the strength and conditioning program for a little bit at my school, but I didn't find that I loved working with the athletic population could have just been sort of uh you know the bias of the sample of people that i was working with because it was division three um but ultimately i kind of worked my way uh, away from athletic training uh, and more into just training general population clients um so you know i started out working with a bunch of just you know regular students at my school um just you know in the gym and, and programming for people online just working with as many people as i could for free uh, and kind of, you know, in tandem with all that happening, I dove deep into the biomechanics side of things. I started learning anatomy. I took a bunch of courses at college and, and uh, you know, even some continuing ed stuff uh, prior to that point. Um, and, you know, from that point on, I kind of fell in love with just the process of, of learning more about the body and learning more about human movement because I kind of identified that like a lot of the coaches that I was around just didn't really seem to to know a whole lot about that. Uh, especially in tandem with a lot of the basic physics stuff that I think most coaches uh, at least should know. Um, so I dove deep into the physics stuff, you know, kind of simultaneously. And now what I kind of have ended up doing is um, finding a good balance between still training enough people in person to where I don't lose that sense of application. But over time, I've worked my way much more into the education side of things. So now I currently work with a lot of personal trainers and strength coaches. Uh, in in working with education based uh, topics, mainly biomechanics, basic physics, uh, you know, anatomy, the whole works, uh, and then kind of on the side, like I said, I, I still do some personal training, uh, you know, about three or four days a week uh, in New York City. So technically speaking, now I'm a personal trainer, um, but I like to kind of think of myself as like a trainer of trainers. So I work with a lot of trainers in just teaching them more and trying to educate them about, you know, anatomy, biomechanics, all that stuff. And, you know, uh, as time goes on here, I do plan eventually on, on hosting, a, you know, my own seminars um, for personal trainers and, and for coaches alike. So that's kind of the, uh, the elevator pitch, uh, the medium version. I would say that was the medium version of, of the pitch. Awesome, man. That's super exciting. Um, Education is definitely something that's, interested me a lot more i mean that's my job now but yep. i mean it's it's i found that there's a completely another level of mastery that you have to have to teach someone else something because you know as a coach you're probably only, only going to use you know a couple percent of what you actually know but then if you were to actually teach someone else something in order to give them the best opportunity for you know the broadest application of, of whatever particular skills you're teaching you really have to know your stuff and so it's a completely different ball game and it's really interesting when you dive into the nitty-gritty on a lot of these things so 
you know, you might listen to a podcast where people are talking about whether failure versus like non-failure training, you know, two to three RIR. And realistically, that stuff is just, in my opinion, really just doesn't matter because no one trains everything to failure. So you would almost always be doing both anyways. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it kind of doesn't really matter, but it's, that's the type of stuff that's like going to end up being a lot more interesting to the coaches and to the other people. So that when they describe it, they can have a very high level uh, conceptual understanding as well as practical understanding of the implementation of a lot of these strategies. Um, but that's, I guess, just sort of my own little tangent. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to, to get your input on is sort of ideological camps in the fitness industry, K kind of with everything. Everyone sort of likes to identify with different camps. Some people will be like, oh, you know, for the nutrition, it's quite common to see people say I'm paleo or I'm, let's say, keto or whatever. And now that stuff is kind of dying down, at least in the circles that I'm in. But what I do see is this emergence of, you know, training paradigm where people become very dogmatic about. And there's almost like this kind of just bro. Then there's the nerds who are like very research heavy. And there's this very small subset of individuals who are like very strong and athletic nerds. And that's kind of this new sort of uh, paradigm that's that's been happening, which has been really cool to see because they have both the practical as well as the research base. But can you talk just about some of those maybe ideological camps uh, that, that are sort of fairly pervasive within the fitness industry? And so people can kind of maybe have a little bit more awareness of the biases that might exist based on who they listen to or, or what sort of uh, you know, paradigms are falling, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. I, I, I find this topic like super, super interesting because it's really relevant to my, um, I think kind of what I view my job as being now, which is not only in part just to kind of try to try to teach things and simplify things, you know, without distilling information too much as best I can, but also to kind of be able to understand where people are coming from much like anything else, I think is super important. So, you know, if if anyone listening has ever trained anyone in person, they can kind of understand intuitively without maybe being able to articulate it that this person is coming into the session, whether they're a mom who's like 45 years old or like a jack dude who's 20 and like who just started taking drugs. They come into the session with all of these like preconceived notions and biases of what training should look like. And much like training, you know, learning about whatever it might be, uh, you know, training, uh, training programming, uh, strength and conditioning research, biomechanics, anatomy, physics, whatever it is, people are going to fall into these camps, I think, just because that's human nature, number one. And then number two is like, whatever people have had success with along the way, they're, they're going to be biased towards. So, you know, I, I just put this little thing up in my story about, um, corrective exercise and you know the 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 phrase the buzzword corrective exercise is very it's very popular now as i think it has been for you know quite some time in the physical therapy space um and i think a lot of the reason that you know corrective exercise works or whatever and i think people have a general idea of like what those kinds of things tend to look like is you know is because i think a lot of the time people take breaks from training when they have these periods where you know maybe they have a little bit of a shoulder boo boo and they do this like uh breathing intervention where they're like reaching and their impression is that they're like recruiting this serratus you know anterior on the left side and you know they have all these theories about why it works but you know maybe the answer is just like uh you know today you didn't do dumbbell bench press or you didn't do barbell bench press. And so you just had a lower amount of stress on, on the joint and, and maybe that's why you feel better. So basically that's just to say that like someone may fall into the corrective exercise camp for a reason that they don't necessarily understand. And so for them to then come out of that camp and to come out the other side, they actually have to start to be able to question why maybe what they're doing has worked and maybe, you know, why eventually at some point it, it won't end up working. Uh, but to be able to get to that point where you, you, you ask those questions, you have to dive deep enough to be able to kind of fully understand the picture. So I kind of, I kind of look at uh, learning as this, like this spectrum or this, uh, this process of like, you know, I forget what the chart is called, but there's like a, the whole idea of 
you know, unconscious incompetence to like conscious incompetence and where you start to develop skills. I kind of look at learning the same way where it's like, initially you think, you know, everything. Cause you think, you know, maybe, maybe you're having success and maybe you're hitting bench PRs every other week. And so you, you feel like, you know, a good amount. And then you start to realize that like, maybe there are some things that you don't know. So, you know, you have a little bit of hesitation about maybe being as certain as you once were. So you dive into those topics and you start to learn a good amount. And then the more that you learn, the more that you realize that like, there's this entire pool of, of information that you're just never gonna really be able to fully understand. And so when you get to the point of like, really, really deeply understanding a topic, you gain the perspective of all the things and all the pools of information that you don't understand. And most people don't get to that point. They kind of stay somewhere in the middle where it's like, maybe they know a little bit, they've dived a little bit sort of, you know, deep into, into whatever topic. And so they're at a point where they're like, they're like, almost unconsciously incompetent with the amount of things that they know where like they're com they're sort of in this like comfortable zone and because they've maybe had success within that zone they think that like that's the zone that everyone should be in it's only at the point at which you dive a little bit deeper you go the next few layers where you start to realize that like oh shit there's all these other things that exist deeper within this pool that i haven't gotten to that maybe are are why you know this other system has worked for other people or this other method or this other corrective exercise so i think it's a matter of just people not necessarily having taken the time to like dive deep enough because once you kind of go all the way down a specific rabbit hole you're only able to gain that perspective that allows you to then come out of that rabbit hole and place in order of importance all of that information that you that you potentially learn from an experience um, so I think people fall into these camps and they, you know, I think that people that do it best kind of fall in and out of the camps, so to speak, um, because they have success with particular things, whether it's a system or a particular form of exercise or training application or, or learning, whatever it is. Um, but the people I think who, who move the farthest, who, who educate themselves the most, who train the hardest, eventually look deeper and deeper and get to the point where they can zoom out again and then kind of put things into their place and put things into perspective. So I actually think this idea of like the ideological camp is very necessary. Uh, as kind of like a step in the process or, a, you know, a step along the way. But I think it's dangerous because like you said, a lot of people tend to get trapped in those places and they get comfortable in those places. And then they don't understand maybe at a certain point where, or, you know, why what they're doing now is no longer working when it once was. Uh, and I think that the people that you see are that are kind of at the top of the food chain, whether it's in performance or education, those are all the people who are like the least certain about all of the things that they're doing and those are the people who will constantly continue to advance because they're looking for other solutions and i think those are the people that you know have had the experiences and, and have the abilities to to dive deep enough to only be able to come out of those rabbit holes to to contextualize everything a little bit better so i think that the camps are are necessary and i've certainly fallen into a ton of different traps as i'm sure you have but eventually i think it's it's a good sign like you said, that some people are actually starting to come out of those and, and to maybe uh, contextualize things a bit further to become this sort of like nerd meathead blend, uh, which is like you said, I think it's something that's almost like an emergent property of people diving into things and then being able to come back out of them and be like, you know, I, I like all this nerd stuff, but I also like all this meathead stuff. So I can kind of dip my toes in, in both pools, so to speak, uh, to, to kind of get the best of both worlds. And I think that's where uh, mastery sort of starts to, to form within any particular domain is like when you have that ability to actually just zoom in and zoom out appropriately at different times to, to contextualize everything together, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And there, there's definitely a benefit to some of those things, like you were saying, because ultimately anything that gets you in the door is most likely going to have more of a net positive, assuming it's not just some completely outlandish wild thing. Like I remember when CrossFit first came out, everyone was getting injured. People were getting fucking rhabdomyolysis and stuff. <laughs> but I was, I was still like, no, this is a net positive because it's, it's one. I don't think anyone does the whole community thing better than they do. Yeah. And that is like, it's well documented that that has an incredibly powerful impact on adherence, on long-term successful weight loss and maintenance. 
and just even like your quality of life, like having a community, right? And having, you know, that social aspect as well. So um, I always saw that as being really beneficial. And I was like, you know, this is going to kind of course correct eventually. They do a lot of stupid shit like high rep snatches and stuff like that, <laughs> but I, or, or like kipping pull-ups. And there's things that yeah. I look at and like, that's a, that's a zero value activity for me. But at the same time, it's still a, a huge net benefit. And then now you look at the athletes and you look at how, how big it's gone. And you, I, I mean, I don't really follow CrossFit, but I suspect that they've made a lot of changes to, you know, those things. I don't really hear the same amount of injuries occurring anymore. And so it's always kind of an evolution. And uh, I mean, ultimately you have to start somewhere. And like you were saying, there does kind of reach a point, but unfortunately, if you're not really in it, maybe you just don't have enough time to go out there. And, or maybe it's not that just the time, but it's like, you don't have the time or desire to really, really come and master a lot of these things. And so you can kind of get stuck in some of these camps, which is a little bit tricky. And I think one of the things that can be very daunting, which is something that I've uh, come across recently is really knowing how to identify what a good quality uh, source of information is. And, and the reason I say that is because um, recently I've been, uh, taking more courses on like uh, computer programming and investing and just different things like that that interest me. And man, I have no experience in investing. You know, like I've had other people who kind of do my investments for me, but now I'm like wanting to take a little bit more ownership of it. And so the one thing that I realized was that instead of trying to cast a net that's like just in a really shallow pool, I was just like, I just want to read as many books on making money, finance, investing, just general stuff, just so I can get a good enough understanding of what the landscape looks like. And then once I feel a little bit more comfortable in that, then I can kind of hone in on what particular areas might interest me the most. But I definitely found that to be a very daunting task. And I think a lot of people come up against the same roadblocks where they see someone who has an MD or a PhD, and they're both saying opposite things. And you're like, well, how do I verify or invalidate one over the other just because they don't have the ability or the pre-existing acumen to actually do that and so i'm not sure if you can kind of speak to that in terms of maybe you have like a, some sort of criteria or just general guidelines in terms of evaluating information um not necessarily definitively but like hey these are things you probably want to look for and these are things you probably want to avoid yeah so that's a really tough thing right because unless you're experienced in any in any domain it's like there's this kind of blind uh you know unfortunate ignorance that comes with you learning anything new which is just like you have no idea who's full of shit and who isn't because you have no idea how to interpret anything that they're saying uh, or contextualize anything that they're saying um and kind of to your point about just just um you know the variety of sources that you have the potential to consume i think that that is the the most important thing to me which is not um which source necessarily that you're you're you know learning from right now it's how many sources over you know whatever span of time you're trying to learn something whether which hopefully is a long time you know how many sources in total are you are you pulling references from um i think that probably the most common question that I will get asked, uh, you know, this, th these last probably three months is like, Hey, what book do you recommend to learn, um, biomechanics or like what, what course do you recommend for me to learn? And I'm like, I guess all the all courses, <laughs> yeah, like fucking every, every book. How's that? Like yeah. every book. Um, <laughs> it's also like, what do you, what do you want to learn? Like for what, what's yeah. your objective, right? Yeah. So the answer that I have, because I've repeated this so many times now, just mostly on like Instagram lives, because that's that's a question I get at probably every single live. If there's one question, it's like, where do I start to learn? Um, so I actually wrote like a little ebook to basically answer that question, um, which has been, you know, it's like the perfect place for, um, you know, or the perfect opportunity to make a product is just like when you get a question enough times, you're like, oh, I should probably just make a product to answer this question. So that that was something I did with an ebook is very introductory. But in terms of like how I answer this more specifically is I'll say, OK, so like let's assume that the general topic is like anatomy, biomechanics. And this is how I sort of accidentally learned a lot of this stuff. 
I'll look at the very generalized topic and I'll say, just find one thing about anatomy, find one thing about biomechanics, one thing about exercise execution selection that you're interested in. Just pick one thing. It could literally be as simple as like the biceps. You wanna learn more about the biceps because like maybe you want your biceps to be bigger. Cool. Go to PubMed, go to Google and just type in biceps brachii, right? Just like type it in. And just kind of see what happens and like do the little game where you go from source to source you know maybe you fucking start on wikipedia and you click biceps and you know under all the wikipedia articles you find an article and then from that article you find something else and from that article you find something else and eventually like you end up learning about the tibia and you have no idea like how you even got there in the first place but you know that like every step along the way was something that was iterative that made sense relative to the previous thing so for instance like when i want to really dive deep into into the research on a particular muscle nine times out of ten i find that like if i start with biceps i end up somewhere completely different and i like don't even know how i got there so it's far less important to me about like which specific sources you're consuming as compared to just like the consistency over time of you trying to consume as many different sources as possible. So if I'm going to try to learn about the biceps, it's not like I'm going to pick one single researcher and just read everything that that person has to say. It's like, yeah, maybe I'll probably read a good amount of what this person has to say, assuming that like generally speaking, other people say that they're credible. But then I'll come, I'll sort of cross reference that. And sometimes I'll intentionally look for things that like say the exact opposite thing so you know in terms of like something that people identify me as it's like they identify me as the anti-stretch guy the anti-static stretcher guy and um i don't like to you know label myself as anything but a lot of the time now if i have you know a, a free span of time or free chunk um what i'll do is i'll try to uh, identify the things that I think that I believe. So, you know, in many instances, I think that there are better replacements for static stretching. So what I'll do is I'll be like, hey, are there any like sort of updated points just in the research or, uh, you know, things that other people have to say that maybe counter what I'm saying, right? And that's not me saying, um, you know, you should always just completely doubt yourself and, and you should lack confidence in your opinions and your beliefs, but more so that like if you do have a belief that you should cross the reference and you should look for other things that say differently, uh, you know, or, or, or say things that are opposed to what you believe so that you can either strengthen your opinions more or have the potential to change your mind. So to me, it's much less about the specific um, about the specific validity of a single source and more about like the amalgam of sources that over a long period of time you can consume. So, you know, with the biceps example, it's like I'll, I could look at like 20 different studies, you know, all of which kind of lead me to my own opinion of like, what does this research tell me? What am I seeing? What am I reading from this research? And, and those kinds of things. The other thing and the, and the thing that would be uh, more specific to your original question, which was like, how can you maybe identify um, you know, in essence, which people are the people that are maybe not full of it and are a little bit more nuanced about their approach. I always lean in the direction of like, the more context that this person provides in their writing, the better. And a lot of times when I will see um, just blanket black and white absolutist statements, that's when I tend to, to, you know, like bells in my head tend to start to ring and you know, my, my bullshit meter starts to like to go off is when people is when people are completely certain about a statement that they're making uh, with no context as to maybe when that statement would be a little bit different or when you would make maybe an exception to that rule. Um, you know, the more context basically that any, whether it's a researcher, whether it's just an author of a book, whether it's someone who's providing me a course, the more context that they can give across different scenarios, the more likely it is that they've really dug deep enough to be able to, um, you know, have, uh, we'll say validity to, to what they're saying. Um, the less that I see people giving context and, and specifying, you know, when something may or may not be true, uh, and the more certain that they seem, the less likely I am to want to dive deeper into that topic or that particular person. Um, just because I think that there are, you know, so much of what we think that we understand is, is subject to change over time. So even now it's like, I tend to, to catch myself slipping up and making absolute statements. And I think that's human nature and I think that's okay. But as long as we kind of course correct our way around that, uh, and eventually come to a point where we say, you know, 
this is what we think that we know rather than this is what we know um you know the better off that we're all ultimately going to be in terms of actually being able to like solve problems that we're running into so that's kind of what i would say generally is point number one being just find the thing that you're interested in and just kind of run with it there's no like right path to this stuff there's no correct uh you know one one way street uh, and then the second is just whoever you're reading whoever you're listening to try to make sure that they're not um you know being completely absolutist at least across all scenarios and try to just make sure that uh, whoever you're listening to or taking advice from has the ability to actually do that whole zooming out thing and contextualize what they're saying rather than just against kind of staying within their rabbit holes and staying within their comfort zones. Yeah, I think that's really undervalued uh, advice actually is the just sort of casting a really broad net, especially initially. And I think one of the big deterrents uh, that I guess that that is in play there is it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work to read a bunch of different stuff. Yeah, you know? I mean, if you've got ten different books and you really know what you're doing, you can kind of look at them and be like, uh, "This is the one that'll give me the most value," you know, yeah. generally. Or at least you can hone it down. Yeah. But if you don't, you might have to read a bunch of books and just sift through a bunch of garbage before you even realize it's garbage. And that was certainly one of my tactics initially was i just read everything i listened to every podcast i read every paper i read every book i bought tons and tons of textbooks and that was all that i did for like years and years and years and years and there was a ton of stuff like you were saying that i believed that i thought was legitimate and i mean you know it's it's that sort of expression like if you look back on your belief six months from uh six six months prior and you're not absolutely disgusted then you're probably <laughs> you know yeah and i tend to believe that, that that's pretty true you know i mean uh because there's just so much learning that happens but there's definitely been a couple of interesting things in terms of uh evaluating you know evidence so one of the things that uh i talk to people about is understanding what evidence actually means you know because a lot of the times people will look at um research and they're like oh like so for instance i guess I'll, I'll kind of backtrack the other day i was hanging out with some friends and they were saying that i was very analytical and that uh, i put a lot of stock in more like empirical data as opposed to um more subjective things or essentially less empirical ways of of uh less empirical evidence and I just was like, I don't think you necessarily understand how this works. Like coaching will almost always be way ahead of the research, like by like 10 years, you know, coaches will be doing stuff way before because we have sample sizes. We can do whatever. We don't have a fucking IRB board. We don't need funding. We don't need anything. We have everything we need almost mm -hmm. always right there. And so we can just test a lot of stuff. And that's why you see the coaches are usually really far ahead and a lot of the times that's what drives the research questions in the first place you know like look at bodybuilding research on protein intake that was all because bodybuilders were saying we need lots of protein and that was very contrarian back in the day and so i think there's this idea that in order for something to be like evidence-based there needs to be research on it and that's just not really true because i think there's a lot of things that we can sort of infer from existing research plus practical experience and i think that amalgamation of the two is something that people really will struggle with uh, like and a great example of this there's quite a few is anytime some new you know conflicting research comes out everyone just wants to jump on board you know injury and technique have no relationship when i heard that i was like that's fucking stupid that's so <laughs> stupid. everyone knows this is stupid and yet I heard so many people with PhDs and doctorates and all that stuff being like, nope, there's, there's no relationship. It's like there's clearly a relationship, but just based on the kind of studies you can run, it's it's impossible for you to even test it because you can't in you can't knowingly injure people. So that right there negates any possibility for you to actually prove the relationship in a study. So I'm like, it's obviously not as clear as uh, as as we think and there's a lot of different variables involved and so it's a really interesting uh kind of i guess avenue of research because it opens up the conversation a lot more than it was before but to jump to that conclusion is just so naive in my opinion and there's plenty of different things like that like even 
you know, people talking about biomechanics and, um, you know, maybe saying, oh, this is the be all end all. And then other people saying like, oh, it doesn't matter. Like I was doing a single arm row and I was doing a, for, for Kabuki, sometimes I'll do like exercises, demos or whatever. And they posted it on their, on their page. And someone's like, oh, why are you going cross body? The lat doesn't have any transverse blah, blah. And I was like, I think you're completely missing everything that I just said in this. And then he was talking about how stretch media and hypertrophy wasn't a thing. And I'm like, almost all the research <laughs> shows that stretch under load is like really important, you know? And so it's just interesting where people kind of, I don't know. It's just like, do the thing and then, and then come back and tell me like, if you haven't done it yet, stop talking shit. Like for me anyways, um, that was one thing that I, I was kind of resistant to failure training until I tried it myself. And then I was like, Oh, oh okay. I get it. You know, I get why people are so you know adamant about this is really important. Um, do you see, what are some of those areas that you find there's a lot of friction on right now that seems just like it's a little bit of a, a novel, like a novelty almost. Yeah. So where my mind goes first with all that, um, because you said a lot of good things there, uh, contextualized things, is, and apologies if you've ever used this terminology or or, <laughs> or like, or whatever. Um, I, I can't personally stand when people say stuff like um, evidence-based workout or like evidence-based program. Or so, so, you know, this is like, this is a common TikTok trend now. And it's like leaking onto Instagram. It's like poisoning the fucking space where people are like, you know, science-based influencer to literally say that in their bio or like, you know, these are my science-based chest and lat workouts. And it's like, well, okay. So that's, that's missing the point. I think entirely of, of science and of evidence. And so you said some things about evidence there that I think are important to touch on. And I'll get back to the the science based thing. Is uh, I think that when we look at research and we ask ourselves, like, okay, what is the point of research? I think ninety nine percent of people who have have not really taken the time to really think deeply about this or look into it will say something along the lines of like, well, we use research and we use science to like find the facts, and you know, the facts they don't they don't really care about your feelings, and so you know science science is fact and we use research to find fact and i think that that's off base in a number of ways i think that the point of research is not to answer questions like i don't think the point of research is to have a question and then answer the question i think the point of research is to propose a question or propose um look into a problem and then having done whatever whatever research in whatever field it is, you, you kind of come out the other end with an ability to ask a more specific question. So it's like you do the research so that you can ask a better question, not so that you can just get an answer and then regurgitate the answer to, to people to sound smart, right? So for instance, um, I'll give a concrete example like this triceps and this is something related to something that you said this is a triceps study that came out like i don't know how long ago probably somewhat recently and it was like this this study on the overhead extension versus the arm at, at the side neutral extension and it showed that in a one-to-one -one, the overhead extension created a, a, a greater degree uh, of hypertrophy as compared to um the the one neutral at your side and so then everyone was like oh my god we ever we need to like swap every exercise every tricep exercise we currently have we need to get rid of it and we need to do this overhead extension because it's better and it's like well no, that's not really like the point right like so it's it's very clear to me that like 99% of people didn't actually read the study. They just like looked at the abstract. They read the one sentence at the end. And then they were like, okay, now we know that this overhead extension is just better. And it's like, if you actually read the study, it's like, yeah, there was a greater in improvement in, in cross-sectional area. But like, what about the 10 other studies that show that like, there's a, there's a, just a difference in terms of the activation and the relative force production between the heads of the triceps and the two different positions. So it's like, each of those things still has their place and all of the other stuff still has its place. 
Um, so what we shouldn't do is we shouldn't read the conclusion and then assume that it's fact and, and ignore the greater context of what different tools are good for and only use that one exercise. What we do is we use the data that we have from that particular study to say, okay, where now does this exercise fit into the greater context of a program? And where does the exercise fit into the, um, you know, where does the exercise fit into not only the program, but also like maybe the micro cycle for the individual? Where does it fit into the context of that particular person's goals, right? So when I look at a study, I look at what other, what questions can I now ask that I have this information? Um, because that will lead to, I think, more specificity, more precision uh, over time. So when people say things like this is a science based workout or this is an evidence based chest and lat workout, it's like, well, that's not what evidence is for. Uh, and that's not what science is for. Science and evidence are not uh, they, they don't exist so that we can make absolute statements. They exist so that we can look at absolutist claims and debunk them in ways that makes them more contextual or true or false under certain pretenses. So when I just see this whole like emergence of people reading research and people citing research, it's like in one sense, it's great because people are now like paying a little bit more attention to what we look at as empirically you know, based uh, claims. But in another sense, it's also like there's another problem now, which is that people are going to the complete opposite side of the spectrum. They're going to the complete opposite extreme. And now, you know, citing research as fact rather than looking at research as just an opportunity to maybe uh, contextualize things to to a greater degree. So I think that there is a ton of application around, you know, those kinds of studies and they can change the way that we do things ultimately or, or maybe our rationales as to why we do things. Um, but I just really despise this trend of like, using uh, science and using evidence uh, in terms of like the individual words as like weaponry to support your biased opinions. Because usually what happens is people form the biased opinions and then they look for the research that supports their biased opinion. And then they present that as fact. When in reality, it's like you could have equally had the the opinion that would go against that biased opinion and you could find something different that likely supports that in a different context uh, and then present that as fact, right? So you could have two opposing sides of an argument that both have validity to what they're saying. And, and it's like, you know, if, if someone is, is really loyal to some particular influencer, it's like they're going to take that one contextualized study as fact when in another scenario it can be the completely opposite thing or it could be, be the completely wrong thing relative to what their goals are with a particular exercise, session, whatever. Um, so I think that the idea that science is fact is like generally it's like I get what people are saying. I understand what people are getting at. Um, but I think that it needs to kind of, we need to take a few steps back and maybe look at the, the bigger picture in terms of what its actual purpose is rather than just using these things as like, like I said, weaponry or ammo to support our emotional, uh, emotional opinions. Yeah. And one of the things that I find frustrating sometimes, um, if I'm talking to someone is every now and then it doesn't happen very often, but every now and then I'll hear like a, a statement, well, you can find you can essentially find a study to prove anything. It's like, well, no, because one, like evidence, you know, and I'm kind of using parentheses because evidence is all encompassing, including anecdote, is weight and aggregate. And so just because you have two studies, that doesn't mean that both studies are equally valid. It doesn't mean that both studies are looking at the same thing. It doesn't mean that both studies are applied in the same context. It doesn't mean that the methodologies of both studies are are the same. It doesn't mean that the statistical analysis or even like the the how, how they evaluate the data and interpret it is the same. And so it's like it, I always kind of explain it similar to a profession. You know, you say, okay, are there good doctors out there? Yes, there's tons. Okay, well, medical malpractice is responsible for like I think it's what the second or third leading cause of death in the United States. Holy shit. Right? So medical doctors are really good and very, very important, but there's also a lot of really shitty doctors out there, you know? And so it's the same thing when it comes to research. It's like, there's a lot of research out there. 
but it's not necessarily all the same. There's a lot of fighters out there, not all the same. There's a lot of football players, not all the same. Like not everyone's going to be Michael Jordan, you know? And so that's kind of a little bit more how I look at a lot of those things. And um, I think if you don't necessarily have that sort of frame of mind, then it can be really difficult to, to tell the difference between the two things. I mean, just like you were saying, it's like, okay, so, you know, if we, if we find, let's say the top five exercises that are going to best train your shoulders, chest, back, biceps, triceps, are we just going to do those five exercises because they've got the, the highest level of like cross-sectional area based on blah, 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 or whatever, you know, it's like, that doesn't really make any sense. You know, no one does just one exercise for their back, you yeah. know, or for their chest. And, and so a lot of the times these conversations end up being sort of pointless when you re when you really look at it kind of like what i was saying earlier about the whole failure training it's like i think it's important to really understand it in, in like greater context but at the same time in application no one really only trains to failure you know and if if for the people who are against failure training it's like okay if you've never trained to failure then you certainly don't know what two to three rr actually looks like so there's yeah. problems on both ends and I, I think it's a really interesting conversation as well to have about um yeah, I guess just about ideological camps. And so there was one, oh gosh, what was it? I also have one thing to say on that. Yeah, if I could interject. So um, to give a good example that I, 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 this example came up about a week or two ago, I was browsing YouTube for whatever reason, I must've been bored. And, um, and this one guy, not naming any names, um, was basically talking about, um, you know, at least in part, he was talking about like static stretching. <clears throat> and so, and this is really all just to give an example, kind of what I was trying to describe, which is just the acontextualization of, of a particular study used as, as ammo or as weaponry or as evidence, uh, with, with, um, you know, air quotes, um so he was like you know he he finished his workout and this guy's like a relatively jack dude um he's not like you know a 300 pound ifbb pro or anything but he's you know someone you would consider uh, probably an advanced trainee and generally speaking it's kind of seems like he knows what he's talking about um to some degree and so he was saying that like after his workouts now he'll do like if he does like he trains lats for instance uh, post workout what he'll do is he'll like stretch out his lats and he'll hold the stretch for you know a minute a minute and a half um and the rationale that he used for that was something along the lines of like uh this this, sh this study showed that like uh static stretches of up to 75 seconds improved cross-sectional area of of muscles over 12 weeks time or six weeks i forget which of those two it was i think it was 12. um and so and when he said it, it was like the title of the study flashed on the screen for like three seconds and then it disappeared. Um, so anyone who's like of the general population sees the flash of the study and they're like, whoa, holy crap, like awesome it's evidence cited science based influencer. Awesome. So I pause it. You know, I pause the video, obviously, and I look up the study and I read the whole study. And the study's participants were 15 to 20 girls between the ages of 13 and 15 years old who played volleyball who had no prior experience lifting or static stretching at any point in their life and what the study did was it conducted um i think it was like probably i think 20 minutes of stretching uh one calf uh one 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 calf uh, a day for i think 12 weeks uh, versus not training the other calf and the difference in cross-sectional area at the end of 12 weeks of the because they were in season they were playing volleyball so they just compared you know what the volleyball did versus the volleyball plus the stretching and the difference was like a 15 percent cross-sectional area difference between calves in terms of total cross-sectional area so it's like okay hold on you're telling me that you use this evidence which again the population for that evidence is girls between the age of 13 and 15 
which nothing wrong inherently with, right? But useful information to have, uh, who have never resistance trained, probably never done a calf raise, uh, and who have also never static passive stretched. That is the population that you're working with, and that is the context under which you're citing this study that says stretching improves hypertrophy, therefore I'm going to stretch after my workout, right? And it's like, here you are, an advanced trainee, a man probably in their 30s, who is using this study as evidence for why you are stretching post-workout. And again, I'm not saying that like it would be impossible for that to improve hypertrophy, but it's like, a, probably a total of like five of the thousands of people who watched that video actually looked at that study and read the entire study and was like, this is actually, this is bullshit, right? So that's just an example of like a scenario where I just, it just pains me because so many people are, are not going to, to read that study. And so many people are probably going to spend minutes after their training, like doing this static stretching because they think that they have to. Uh, you know, to, to get the most optimal results. And it's like, man, you know, it's, it's, it, it's in a way it feels like deceitful to me to, to do that kind of a thing when it's that uh, a contextualized. So that's just an example, uh, something that I haven't expressed before. So I thought I would yeah. do it now. I, I think that, uh, I think that stuff happens a lot, you know, and I mean, the idea okay. that something as, as like, something that is so low on the in terms of like actual physiological disruption that that's going to create significant differences in hypertrophy for someone who's a very advanced lifter or even like an intermediate lifter i just don't really buy it personally you know and i think those are some of the details that if you don't like if you don't know what you're looking for it's really hard to tease out those things yeah and a great example of this actually is uh, a while back a couple months ago I, um, there was a, there was like this widespread adoption of a couple of things that I was like, this is problematic and everyone's just jumping on board and being like, oh, uh, you know, like this is the way that it is, blah, blah, blah. And it was like very dogmatic. And so I was kind of, I, I was a little sneaky. What I did basically was I went in and I read, I read the paper and, and the kind of adjoining papers. And uh, I posted on my story, I was like, hey, and I changed, I changed what the study was about. I changed the actual, um, uh, the actual like entire, like classification of what the study was. So it was a psychological study. I turned it into a nutrition study. You know, so, so I changed everything about it, but I kept the variables the same. So I was like, okay. There is a study that, you know, it was, uh, it was supposed to be a randomized control trial, but after uh, two months, they unblinded everyone. The demographic was not representative of the demographic that they were trying to, to determine, you know, whether or not this thing was effective. And I was like, here are all, and I just listed just, I think just five points. There was dozens upon dozens upon dozens of issues that I, that I, kind of looked at and I was like, these are red, major red flags, but I listed five that most people would understand. And I just put them on there and I was like, okay, this is a nutritional study that I was reading based on just these five points here. Do you think that you would trust this? And I had tons of people be like, nope, that's garbage. Oh yeah. It's funded by this person. Yeah. Fuck that. Da, da, da. Everyone was saying, no, I messaged each of these people individually and was like, Hey, uh, would you be surprised if I told you that this was what the study was actually about? And the number of people who like blocked me, deleted me, called me like just <laughs> names and all this shit was shocking. It was over 90%, right? And this was like almost 100 people, I think, that, that I ended up messaging. And it's like, okay, so you're not even staying consistent with your own evaluation criteria, you know? And I think that that's a really important thing that not a lot of people really appreciate. Like, I know that I have bias and, and I've fully talked about it. Like recently, I, I've specifically said like, you know what, I definitely put a lot more stock in like anecdote now than I used to before. That was something that really shifted for me was when I started, you know, doing a lot of things and I was like, oh, there is no research on this or, oh, like, you know, if if John Jewett is saying that he swears by this, 
And there's not really any good reason to, to disbelieve him. It's probably something you should look into because the dude knows what the fuck he's doing, you know? Yeah. And so I, I don't know. It's just interesting how people will start to, I guess, shift and evaluate things differently and then how that might change if it's something that they really believe in, you know? Um, but I, I wanted to kind of get your perspective on, on some of the, the things that you were mentioning earlier about, you know, tissue remodeling and static stretching versus maybe doing some loaded movements and just general orthopedic health. So when we're looking at orthopedic health, like, and, and this is just my perspective, I'm a big believer that like your training should be the rehab or the prehab, you know, if you're doing movements that are, you know, allowing you to access different ranges, you should be able to stay fairly healthy. But like one, what are your thoughts on that? And then two, do you have any specific things that you might do to improve, not necessarily improve, but let's just say maintain a reasonable level of orthopedic health and range of motion. So if you are someone who's like a really big power lifter, you're not just completely limited in terms of what you can do from like a movement uh, capacity standpoint. Yeah, so I always look at task specificity first because I think that that's a hugely important thing that is overlooked. So, you know, to the point of powerlifting specifically, it's like, well, what are the what are the primary demands and what are the primary positions that you're stressing over and over and over? And like, what is the aggregate sort of like, uh, you know, stress that you're having to deal with from that orthopedic perspective? What are the specific forces that you're dealing with on a consistent basis? that maybe you know we want to get away from in the accessory work or maybe that we want to you know include specific things to kind of supplement that so just to give an example that people will kind of you know more intuitively understand it's like all right well uh if i'm bench pressing you know three or four times a week because i'm you know a couple months out from a competition whatever um and i look at the position that i'm you know uh stressing my we'll say my upper extremity and well it's like all right um, you know, from like a, a, a tissue specific perspective, it's like I have a lot of stress and a lot of load and a very lengthened position of my pecs, a lengthened position of my delts, uh, a retracted position of my shoulder blades, an extended position of my shoulder, a flex position of my elbow, all those things. And so it makes sense to me from an orthopedic standpoint to get into positions potentially that I'm not stressing as much in the main lifts um from an again from an orthopedic perspective to potentially improve either the ranges that i'm not getting into in the main lift or just the specific force output in different positions that i'm not getting into in the main lift so you know what that may look like is uh, you know a, an example of like um a specific exercise is like a cross body cable extension where i'm literally like finding the exact opposite you know joint action position of where my arm would be in a, in a bench press at the bottom of the bench press. And I'm, you know, I'm protracting my scap, I'm flexing and adducting my arm, I'm creating the most amount of resistance potentially in the fully elbow extended position. And that's a way that like I conceptualize this, not necessarily that it's that it's accurate across the board, but the way that I look at the orthopedic stress conversation is basically like, what are the positions that I'm really creating a lot of stress in? And how can I potentially get out of those or strengthen positions that are not that same thing? Uh, I think there is something to the conversation around looking to just get those positions stronger. But I think for a majority of people that number one, the main lift kind of serves that purpose for them. Uh, and, and that number two, up to a certain point, you're only going to be able to handle so much. So a kind of, you know, uh, alternative example is like, let's say you're dealing with a bodybuilder and um you know maybe they're struggling with you know their recovery in their hamstrings for instance but their hamstrings are a potential weak point for them you know whatever however subjectively they've determined that um you know but maybe they're trying to train hamstrings twice a week and just on that secondary day it's like they're just still thrashed from that first day their output on the secondary day isn't necessarily improving you know maybe their perception of soreness is still high whatever whatever 
maybe then you know in, instead of doing you know a more length and biased exercise on the on the first day maybe instead of doing a hinge based movement maybe i do like a lying you know leg curl uh, to, to potentially not only change the position that I'm stressing, uh, but also, uh, you know, from, from a, an actual positional standpoint, just to decrease the output, but, uh, you know, keep in an exercise that is going to tax the tissue as much as I, as I want it to. So, you know, I kind of use the different positions and understanding the biomechanics of every movement more so as a way to just redistribute stress than anything else. I think we could obviously get into the specifics of like, oh, what does the research say about shortened position versus lengthened position and stretch mediated hypertrophy versus like more of a metabolic demand? Like we could get into the theory behind that, but I think at the end of the day, it's like, what are the positions that you're exposing yourself the most to? And how can we either make those positions stronger, you know, depending on the individual's level of advancement or how can we get out of those positions and stress the same tissues but in a way that's not as costly either in terms of absolute load uh, or just in terms of uh, positional stress relative to to those other specific positions so i think for me the orthopedic conversation comes down to what positions are you stressing more than anything else and then beyond that, if I do find that, like, you know, I am, you know, however I've determined that I'm missing range of motion in whatever joint I'm looking at, well, then what I'm going to best do is try to actively get myself into those positions, not necessarily by pulling myself into them with weight or by forcing myself into them with, you know, some sort of passive strategy. Um, but I'm going to actively try to get the person to do it on their own. Uh, right. So an example of that may be if I'm trying to improve shoulder flexion, I'll do an exercise that uh, loads shoulder flexion rather than trying to get them to maybe hang from a pull up bar. Maybe I'll do something with a cable where I'm actually trying to get their arm up and across their body, but under a situation where, um, you know, they're actually having to, to get into those positions on their own. Um, because I think across the board, when we talk about range of motion, I always look at range of motion as very, very specific. I think that you need to specify when you're talking about passive range, when you're talking about active range, when you're talking about a situation where an end range is loaded or a, a more lengthened position is loaded because you could measure range of motion at the same joint five different ways and you could get five different outcomes of range in that position. So a lot of people now, and this has been more of a recent trend in personal training, will actually like lie their clients down and assess their like external rotation or their internal rotation of their shoulder while they're lying supine on the table. And it's like, well, why is that the particular position that you picked to assess function? Why didn't you lie them prone and have them do it actively? Why didn't you have them sit up and, and hold the abduction in their arm as they externally rotated? Uh, why didn't you do it with a weight to see what they could do actively, right? There are like 10 different questions you could ask about why this, why that. And ultimately, at the end of the day, the range that they're assessing, you find is actually completely arbitrary. And so what they've determined as uh, a range that is lacking is actually a position that in the first place was was chosen randomly. So it's like, you know, how you're determining range of motion in the first place needs to be specific to that loading scenario and that position, um, rather than just arbitrarily looking at a textbook and being like, you know, this person needs this amount. Um, and I think people will present whether or not they've got enough range of motion for what they need, just in the way that they experience, you know, either the specific lift or in the way that they respond orthopedically to those same positions uh, over time. So kind of a lot to look at there, but at the end of the day, I think it's really important just to kind of consider the end of one with everyone uh, because, you know, some some people who are maybe in bodybuilding may not need ranges of motion that others may in powerlifting and those same powerlifters who maybe find that they have to get into particular positions as a result of like the competition specificity may just as a result of their structure have to sacrifice certain things orthopedically to get to those places um but that's you know kind of a different conversation around how you know competition and, and athletics is not you know the same as as health uh so those are kind of my general thoughts uh and some specific thoughts on on that stuff yeah no it definitely makes sense i'm uh I'm definitely a big believer in, in longevity and making sure that the athlete can essentially sustain high levels of performance for a very long time. I've always noticed that for myself initially, I would get injured all the time. 
and I'd be making crazy progress and something would happen to derail me. But it was always the injuries. And then when I started training more people, I noticed that was a really common thread. And so mm -hmm. I started putting a lot more emphasis on like, hey, let's just keep you healthy. Let's just keep you like, or build resilience. Let's just try and do these things. And so um, I have for a very long time been a big fan of things like Jefferson curls or like loading your spine in a flexed position. And I've, people have been like telling me, oh, you're so stupid or you're this or you're that. And it's like, <laughs> sure, okay, whatever. But at the end of the day, the number of people who I have like, I don't want to say fixed, but to some degree fixed where it's like they came in presenting with certain things and I'm not a physical therapist. And so for me, whenever someone comes in with something, if it's, I have kind of a, like a gradient system that I'll, I'll use to, to assess. But um, if it's, if it's beyond like, you know, let's say like a three or maybe even a four out of 10 in terms of pain and like where their pain presents and a bunch of other things. But if it's lower on that end, I, I definitely feel very confident in terms of like managing that stuff. Um, if it's something that's a little bit more complex, if it's something like even where I'm like, I could, but I don't know, like I still will always just refer out because I'm like, you know what? The athlete's health is, is paramount. But when we're talking about like, oh, I tweaked my back. Oh, I did this. Oh, I did that. The number of times that I've helped people like build up resiliency in their back, develop, you know, more strength and stability in their hips using Jefferson curls or deficit stiff legs or whatever, or like just loading their spine even. So like doing maybe a seated good morning, but really flexing in. It's like people seem to be really resistant to that, but I'm like, yeah, okay. But what if you, what if you're doing like a max deadlift and your back starts to round a little bit? Like what, what happens then, you know? And people were like, oh, well, you can't do heavy loading. And I'm like, okay, let's look at it this way. You know, I can front squat over 500 for like maybe a triple. If I'm doing round back deadlifts with like, like a Jefferson curl off of like, let's say six to eight inches, and I'm using like 300 pounds, do you think that's going to do fucking anything to my back? No, <laughs> I'm going to a really good pump and that's about it. I could be rowing that stuff. You know what I mean? So it's, I'm not mm -hmm. saying go and do all this crazy stuff, but at the same time, it's like, like you were saying, it's contextual. And I think a lot of the times, if you just sort of explore different ranges, you can really learn a lot about where your limitations are. And oftentimes you can find, you know, potentially like muscular deficiencies. I'm not sure if you're familiar with like Megan Bryanton's work. Nope. Uh, Megan Jones, she, she's a power lifter, but she's also a biomechanist. I think she has her PhD in, in biomechanics. And um, she's done a lot of really interesting research uh, on power lifters and talks about muscular contributions and stuff like that. And so uh, utilizing exercise selection and different, you know, workload strategies to, to build up technique because, but anyways, I guess it's neither here nor there, but, you know, utilizing maybe strategies like that to improve longevity, to improve performance and dynamic correspondence and stuff like that. And so it's, I just think that like you've got so much to learn if if you can experiment <laughs> and not trip out a little bit too much about what other people are maybe saying if you're like because i had so many people telling me oh like because i had a very serious back injury where i was on like crutches for like 11 months 10 months had to wear a back brace like couldn't do anything they're like okay you can't sit but don't stand too long don't lay down definitely don't have sex and i was like awesome. <laughs> so i'll just go kill myself and they were treating me same thing they were treating me like those you know 13 year old girls you're talking about right where yeah. it's like, oh let's stand on a bosu ball let's do this let's do and i'm like dude you know i'm a power lifter right like i need this is nothing this is no stimulus for me and they're like oh we need to do this and i was so after like seven months of this because i was pretty scared so I, I really wanted to defer to the authorities but after about seven or eight months i was like "Fuck this i'm doing it myself i went right back into lifting weights and doing a lot of loaded like spinal flexion work and now my back is like stronger than ever, you know, and that's, that's, again, it's an N of one, but, um, I think that you really just kind of have to explore and see what, see what works and see what happens. And, you know, in some ways, like there's definitely things that I wouldn't do loaded in spinal flexion, but at the same time, it's like, you kind of start to know where your boundaries are and what makes you feel better. What kind of produces the, the sort of like feeling where you're like, Oh, I feel really good. I'm feeling athletic, but I'm still like, strong or big or whatever it might be but yeah kind of went off on like a totally unnecessary tangent well, well no i i also think that it's important that people take that into context right which is not you saying 
you know, put as much as you can Jefferson curl on the bar right now and go do Jefferson curls, right? You have to take into context like that there are at least seven different components of like force specifically under, you know, adaptation and just being able to actually uh, take all those things into account in the context of you is super important. So if someone is like has pain bending over to touch their toes, it's probably not a super good idea to like, you know, put 315 on the bar and Jefferson curl, right? So that's not what you're saying. What you're saying is that there are particular contexts under which the things that people think are potentially dangerous for them might actually not be dangerous and are only perceived that way just because of, um, you know, this anecdote, that anecdote, this research article, that, you know, that meta-analysis and so on and so forth. So, you know, I think that people just have to be willing to try to be a little bit more precise about exactly what they're trying to do and what they're what they're even saying or what they even think about a particular thing rather than just like our you know as per our conversation earlier um you know whether they're just you know falling into these ideological camps uh you know to begin with and then potentially lynch pinning themselves from uh you know making progress in a vector that they they really want or need to um you know because anytime that you let that emotional bias kind of overcome your um you know your ability to explore different things uh, you're potentially limiting yourself so uh, i think that's great that you just said fuck it uh you know fuck the pts and just went on your way jefferson curling yeah and so i guess i guess there are a couple things that i probably should um clarify so when i started doing them uh like this is after i was rehab but when i started doing them again i was using like 70 kilos on the bar you know, so I didn't just jump into it, even though like it felt very light, I wouldn't just jump into it. So there is definitely like a graded progression you would use to build tissue tolerance exposure. The second thing is I also don't give that exercise to almost anyone. It's very rare that I actually will prescribe it to people because they need to have a certain degree of movement competency in order to do that. Or else, yeah, it probably does increase your risk of injury. But if you know how to move properly and if you are, you know, let's say late intermediate to advanced, then it can be very, very effective for individuals. And so, you know, th this is like one specific example. And so it probably shouldn't be like extrapolated to be like, oh yeah, I should do this, <laughs> obviously. Um, but another thing that I wanted to talk about, I guess, to, to sort of wrap things up here is um, this emergence of coaches, particularly let's say strength coaches and maybe bodybuilding coaches who are weak, and skinny you know this is something that i feel very passionate about you know because i've i've debated people and on this and it's just i don't think it's a defensible position that you can have where it's like if you're a strength coach and you're weak or if you're a bodybuilding coach and you're small and if you've never been strong or jacked what are you doing like how much can you really know because i've heard people say you know oh, well, not everyone has great genetics. It's like, okay, sure. But anyone who's been training for 10 to 15 years will look like a completely different human being than when they started. So show me that. I want to see that. And if you can't show me that, I really suspect that you actually don't know as much as you actually know. And the one thing that I'd love to get your feedback on this, but the one thing that I've noticed is that there's these <clears throat> individuals, I was one of them when I first started because I was way more intro like I'm introverted. And so my whole thing was like not necessarily meeting people and learning from them. I was like books, 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 you know? And so people who are really slick communicators, people who are articulate, who can convey messages in an easy to understand way. And yeah, are just very good communicators, but don't really know a whole lot and can't really like demonstrate that versus let's say someone like louis simmons who and i love using him because everyone will shit on him and be like oh he's wrong about physics he's wrong about this and it's like yes when he's saying it he's wrong but how he's applying that stuff obviously works or else he wouldn't have been able to pull eight or nine world champions just from the same city it's like mm -hmm. that's statistically so implausible you know yeah. so it's like clearly his application is really high level and his understanding is really high level but he just doesn't know how to communicate worth a damn so it's sort of bridging that gap between like practical experience and just versus just being like a kind of a smooth talker. And so I wanted to get your, your perspective on, cause that's sort of a paradigm shift that I've noticed as well, 
where it's like, oh, well, just being big doesn't mean you're a great coach. And it's like, neither does being skinny, motherfucker. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, it, it's like yeah. you're not making an argument for yourself. But that's how I feel. I feel very passionate about it. But I would love to hear if you think the same, if you think different, if you want to push back on any of that stuff, I'd love to hear it. Yeah. So I think like I like all other things, the the um, the most accurate appraisal of this conversation is somewhere in the middle, which is like I think that people are mostly dealing with what they've been given. OK, so I'll, I'll give a few for instances. So, you know, this skinny nerd coach or the fat nerd coach who's like never, you know, pulled fly, five plates or whatnot. They're probably someone who, yeah, maybe genetically, like we're not as inclined as the person who was benching, you know, four or five in high school. Uh, and so what they kind of gravitated toward along their journey was like the books. They gravitated toward the learning and they gravitated toward um, doing taking as many courses as, as possible. And that's kind of understandable, right? Because that's how they like gain their value. That's how they got other people to be like, oh, this person has like something worth listening to. And then the person on the other side of the spectrum, you know, for instance, the person benching 405 in high school was never really the person that felt like they needed to to go off and to learn where the pec inserts, right? Or where the, you know, what, how many triceps you have, right? Uh, they, they were never the person that really felt like to add some sort of value that they had to go off and, and learn something. Uh, and so I think that, you know, both ends of the spectrum, right? Both, both of those individuals are kind of just, uh doing the best with the cards they've been dealt so to speak and the people who find their way to the middle are probably the people who have gone far enough and realize that there are limitations to both sides of the spectrum right the the super nerd who's who can't pull four plates probably realized at some point like oh like these jack people over here like they kind of you know keep poking fun at me and like i feel like i know a lot so like why are they doing that maybe they have a point like maybe enough people have said the same thing to where it's like okay you know some people are stupid but not everyone is stupid so if everyone is kind of telling me this like you know similar thing this similar story i should probably start to listen you know and and, and same goes for the other side of the spectrum like the first person that i thought of when you said that was like a ronnie coleman right ronnie didn't probably even know that you know he has three different divisions of his lat right but like did it fucking matter for him no he's the greatest bodybuilder of all time so clearly there's also something to just like training as hard as possible eating a shit ton of food and taking the right drugs right there's clearly validity to that but then there's also that the side of that coin which is like well kind of look at the way he is able to move now right can't doesn't move too well in his his i don't know how old he is now probably his 50s or something like that right but he's had god knows how many back surgeries he's had surgeries uh, you know in other places so it's like clearly there's validity to what all the nerds are saying, which is like you should probably take into consideration these other orthopedic factors and maybe listen to your body uh, and, and learn a thing or two about anatomy and physics so that you don't end up in a wheelchair, you know, at 50 because you're a dumbass in your 20s, that kind of a thing. So I think that, you know, the the kind of uh, the the balance between these two things is where the best possible scenario is. But whether or not you get pulled out of either side, I think mostly has to do with who is in your circle and how self-aware that you are. So I was never the person who was benching four or five in high school, right? But I learned to train super, super hard because I had people around me who who were that person, right? Or or you know, who who were the people who were deadlifting five plates when they were, you know, 15 years old. I had those people to kind of push me and inspire me to to want to lift more. But at the same time, I recognized that I wasn't that person. So, you know, I kind of dabbled over on this other side of things with all these people who who never really lifted and who just got into the research side of things to also learn from them. So I think that both people are correct simultaneously. And I think that like if we could just kind of start to bridge this gap a little bit better, then everyone would be better off because everyone would understand that like we both have good intentions with what we're saying um, and like but like we're not really being nice about it. Right. Like we're not really communicating it effectively. Um, and I think that those two extremes, you know, the Ronnie's and then total nerds exist for a good reason, uh, which, again, is to just represent the validity of, of both sides of the coin. 
Um, but at the end of the day, I think the more that we can kind of work to understanding the other side, the better. Uh, I don't think that there's any usefulness or, uh, necessarily in uh, like roasting other people for, you know, not being strong or like making fun of people for not being as smart as they potentially could be. Um, uh, unless they're being, you know, a pompous asshole about it, which a lot of people are. So uh, I understand where it comes from. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, this whole conversation is uh, kind of what I'm trying to do with like whatever you want to call Ben's brand, which is like I'm trying to combine these worlds and I'm trying to get one side to see the other um, while ex trying my best to explain both sides of it. Um, because I have been at a place where, you know, I thought that there knowing the most amount of things is the most important. And I've also been at a place where, you know, training hard and just eating a lot and sleeping well is, is the end all be all of, of all these questions. Um, and like I said, I think like most other things, the answer is somewhere in the middle. And so if we can, if we can take the meatheads and if we can take the nerds and if we can, and we can mix and mash those two worlds, I think the outcomes will be, you know, potentially better than they ever have been. Um, so that would kind of be my, my take on that. Um, I try not to take sides for, for reasons, um, that are in my own self-interest, meaning that, uh, I, I try to pick sides based on who I'm talking to and where they're coming from. Um, and it seems like you have managed to strike a good balance between being a meathead and also being a nerd, uh, which is pretty cool to see the, the greater prevalence of like people like you and, and potentially people like me in this industry. And I think that the more that we can kind of gravitate toward moving in that direction, the better off that everyone is going to be, um, you know, regardless of whatever camp you, you kind of fall into, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it's the biggest thing for me is it's just important to be like cognizant of the blind spots. Like, you know, for me, when I say you have to be a strong coach or you have to be jacked, that's a really nebulous term, but I'm doing that intentionally because it's like, do you need to be Ronnie Coleman? No. Do you need to be 250? No. But show me what you looked like and show me what you look like now. And then on top of that, show me what athletes you produced. Yeah. If you can do both of those things, because like, so, so look at Eric Helms, right? Eric Helms is a great example of a super fucking smart guy. He also has an insane physique, but he's not, he's like, he's like what, six, one, six, two, something like that. Yeah. But he's not, he's not massive. Like he's not an IFBB pro because he he's natural. Right. But you look at him and you're like, okay, that dude clearly knows what he's doing. His, his conditioning is, is crazy and he knows what his limitations are. So he doubles down on his conditioning, which is a great strategy, you know, but if you were to look at him now versus where, when he started, it's like, man he went real far if you were to compare him to let's say chris bumstead obviously there's no comparison because of drug use and stuff like that so it's not like you need to be the top but you do need to be able to demonstrate hey i used to be here now i'm here not only that but i've taken athletes from here to here or at one point you were able to do that you know because like a lot of people point to borshiko and they're like oh and they do the mic drop i'm like uh i don't know if you know this but he was uh, on the junior national powerlifting team and he was like, going through the Russian sports program. And so it's not really like accurate to say that he wasn't like that. So I'm like, I don't know. And, and yeah, I don't know. It's just funny sometimes when I hear that conversation come up, but a lot of the times as well. So I made a post, I actually pinned it on my, what did I say? I'm going to try. Oh, there, my phone's off. So it doesn't ring, but it was something to the effect of like more and more I'm seeing skinny, weak guys, educating others <laughs> on how to get jacked and strong yeah they're strong communicators they're articulate and they know the research or whatever but they or no they, they hide their lack of work ethic and inability to produce results behind articulate like communication and blah 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 and like in scientific jargon and i was like knowing the research is important but if you can't apply it then you're not an authority you yeah. know and that, that was like my little post or whatever and then it was funny because everyone automatically assumed that I was like, oh, so what you're saying, you're all meatheads. And I'm like, no, I'm like, no, that it's not like if I say, hey, I don't like Hillary Clinton, that all of a sudden I'm like a Donald Trump fan, you know? It's <laughs> yeah, like yeah. And so, yeah. but, but I understand why people probably think that, that I have that, uh, that perspective, but yeah. I and this, this kind of comes, it's a great when things come full circle. Cause it's, this is going to tie into our conversation earlier 
which is that I think that it's important for people in this within this conversation and in this context, I think it's important for people to go down rabbit holes. And um, I, you know, power lifted just recreationally for years before I really got into bodybuilding. Um, and when I got into bodybuilding, it's still now my, my so my training partner is um, he got his pro card uh, last October, so about a year ago. Um, obviously, like huge guy, very, very well versed in all things training, and he's very deep into the education realm as well. He's like one of those more rare instances. And when he and I started training together, uh, you know, we were training five days a week. We were doing fucking like 10 exercises a workout, and we were doing between two and four sets on every exercise, and every single exercise was to failure. Like every single exercise, regardless, was to failure, just everything to failure. And, you know, that was also the first time that I really was like force feeding myself for a very long period of time. So I had this like, you know, six months, eight months span where I was training super hard, two to three hours, five days a week, every set to failure, eating as much as I possibly could. You know, I put on like more than 20 pounds in, in like eight months or less. Uh, and so that was kind of like my deep dive into, you know, what training like an IFBB pro is like. And so, you know, if I hadn't had that experience, I probably wouldn't feel nearly as confident actually talking to pros about training. Uh, number one, because I would have never worked with one in the first place, uh, but also because I would have never trained and tried to eat like one, you know, relative to, you know, my body weight, my structure, all those things. So I think there's an, an immense amount of value in doing that kind of thing. Um, and I also think that there's an immense amount of value in doing the opposite uh, in terms of, um, you know, reaching to the other side of the spectrum and, and diving into the research and all the things that we've talked about. Um, but I think ultimately that, you know, having both of those experiences is will, you know, produce the best outcome or or at least a better outcome than than being overly biased to one side uh, or the other. I think it's good to, again, go down those rabbit holes and come out just to have that perspective and to be able to contextualize things uh, and, and also, you know, have have real experience to back up what you're saying and not just, you know, a bunch of words and, and, and empty action, uh, so to speak. No, absolutely. I think that's a great place to uh, to finish as well. So where can people find you, Ben? Just my name on Instagram and everything's under there. Instagram is Instagram is like the homeland. You go to Instagram, you find the link in bio. Awesome. Boom. To the OnlyFans, yeah? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Sweet. So all that stuff's going to be linked up in the show notes, guys. Definitely make sure you go give him a follow. He puts out lots of really great content and does it in a really, uh, really easy to digest way through like memes and stuff like that. So it's, it's pretty cool. It's pretty entertaining as well. So Ben, man, thanks for, for jumping on. I really appreciate the conversation. Daniel, thanks for having me on, man. Appreciate it.